Now, the second thing I want to tell you about the risk analysis that I found out is who they hired. It was to be called an independent peer review. Independent peer review. Let's peer review all the studies that have been done by an independent entity. The company that won the contract, this RFP, for the $200,000, had an existing contract at Lanol worth millions of dollars. In other words, they were Lanol's contractor. Okay? They had an existing contract, what I call a biggie wiggy, because it's a multi million. And this was a teeny weeny. And no company will risk the biggie wiggy for the teeny weeny. Okay? Is that clear? Those are things we learned in school. This is inherent. This is, we talk about inherent safety. This is inherent conflict of interest. You can't do it. Second of all, the company that they hired, the company that they selected, and I don't know who I'll bid, I've not filed a NIPRA request to see the bids. The company they hired was a company called Chemrisk. Chemrisk is run by a fellow named Dennis Postenbach. Dennis Postenbach has a long reputation in the, sun, in the field of risk engineering. Dennis Postenbach's reputation, known reputation, is to defend large corporations against lawsuits by people who have been poisoned by them. That is what he specializes in. His resume, I've never seen a resume, single spaced 153 pages is his resume of things that he's done representing the automotive industry, the chemical industry. He has worked for every major polluter, always on the behalf of the polluter against a defendant lawsuit. And he's done it very, very, very successfully, except for one time. PG&E hired him to hide the hexavalent chromium that they dumped in Hinckley, California. And were it not for Aaron Brockovich, oh. that case never would have been blown open. Oh. This is who Dennis Postenbach is. A Clinton aide once called him Dr. Evil for all of the things he'd done. They said he never met a chemical he didn't like. Now this is all hearsay. I'm expressing opinion now. This is not, I'm wandering outside of engineering. But the Environmental Working Group in California called him a leading junk science peddler. And if you look and you research what they've done, he's been cited many times. He's had journal articles retracted for unethical behavior. Now, why, when you're looking at a risk analysis for a 100,000 people, a water system to serve 100,000 people, why would you hire somebody with such a reputation? And why would you hire them a year after construction begins? And why would you spend $200 million prior to the results of the analysis coming in? I don't know a lot about forensic journalism. <laughs> But I know when something smells bad. And that's what I've been talking about on the Buckman. That's what I've been doing on the Buckman. So let me fast forward to this week. I told you I had a hard week. The beginning of the week I made a phone call. I, I, I barely want to mention names in this, but I called a water purification company in town. And I said, what's the deal on tritium? because Joni sent an email out a couple of weeks ago that said, help, tritium found in the Buckman Wells. Does everybody know what tritium is? It's an isotope of hydrogen. It's an, uh, yeah, it's an isotope of hydrogen. In other words, it's a hydrogen element, atom, that has a couple of extra neutrons on it. And those couple of extra neutrons in the nucleus make it radioactive. But then, once it's radioactive, the hydrogen acts like any other hydrogen, can bond with oxygen to make water molecules. And what you have is not water, but tritiated water. It's a great word, tritiated. But what I called Steve Wyman to ask about, I didn't know that much about tritium. I called him to say, is there a way to filter out tritium? And he said, well, you know, I know this scientist up at the lab, and why don't I invite him down? He'll give us a lesson in tritium. He'll, he'll just come down here and teach us about it. He'll go to the blackboard. He's amazing. He's not a company man. So we scheduled this meeting for Thursday night. I walk into the meeting, and not only is this Los Alamos scientist there, but there are three officials from the Buckman Direct Diversion there. There's actually two there, and the third one, he's dialing the phone, and it's the head of the Buckman Diversion on the speakerphone. You know, I went to a meeting that I thought was my little, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a scientist, and I'm going to a classroom meeting to talk about the science of tritium, and instead, I've got officials from the Santa Fe shoving documents under my nose, showing me there's no problem with tritium. It's like, it's not really why I'm here, but it stunk. It stunk to me. I was offended. I, you know, and I called the fellow up the next day and I said, first of all, don't ever do that to me again. 
And second of all, I would have prepared entirely differently if I'd known I was having a meeting with officials. You do different things to prepare for those meetings. At any rate, they continue to shove documents under my nose showing me that there's no problem with tritium. So, you know, I complain that, you know, the correct documentation on the tritium. First of all, let, let, let's look at the history of the tritium detect. The tritium detections were March of 2011. There was no letter from Lanell suggesting a possible problem for five months after that tritium detection. When the samples come in, March 14, the samples were taken. When the samples come in, it's imperative that the laboratory do an analysis immediately. So the analysis was done on March 15 and 16 and 17. And for five months, there was no mention. And when there was a mention after five months, it was in a letter that pointed out a discrepancy. Not a tritium detect, a discrepancy. It was another two and a half months before Lanell wrote a letter to Santa Fe Buckman personnel describing a, uh, a result, an actual result, that showed a high tritium reading. Seven, we're at seven and a half months out now. At eight months, uh, an official from Santa Fe writes a letter back to Lanell with a series of questions on why did it take so long and what the hell's going on over there. Lanell waits another month and writes back an explanation. And here's the explanation after nine months. All of you speak English, right? <laughs> the laboratory identified the two tritium detects on the March 14, 2011 sampling event as elevated compared with previous results immediately after pulling the data from the laboratory's database. The laboratory requested that an analytical review that an analytical laboratory review the data packages to ensure the accuracy of the results. However, the review was not completed before the 120-day deadline for releasing the data to the public or posting it to the database. Say what now? Basically, all they, said, all they, did, all they just did was admit that they blew a deadline. A 120-day deadline, a four-month deadline. The August 16, 2011 letter reporting the March 16, that's the wrong date, sampling, March 14, she said, sampling event did identify a discrepancy between the March 14, see this is five months left, they're admitting a discrepancy, between the March 14 sample analyzed and previous results analyzed by this other laboratory. So now they're comparing the March 14 anomaly to a previous test that's not even in question. I don't know why they're talking about it. The discrepancy was attributed to differences in each laboratory's minimal detectable activity and counting uncertainty. It has recently been determined that rounding functions and input errors are factors that resulted in the tritium detections. Factors that resulted, not causes. Factors that resulted in. I mean, that's not even English. There's no, there's no conclusion in there. There's no conclusion of what happened. There's no... And later they say it's, you know, round-off errors in the spreadsheet. This round-off error thing has come up a number of times. Remember who we're dealing with here. <clears throat> Over the last two years, the laboratory has transitioned from using one lab to this other lab, and we're working with the lab to match our data quality requirements. So it was all an issue of quality. They were just trying to get the quality up on the data. But again, you know... And then what happens is, as a result of this, you know, this came out. Joni sent me the link that had this, and it's all supposed to be public information. They sent along this huge document. You know, and, and this is a problem. How many of you have a lot of spare time in your, in your day to read, you know, 100-page documents of technical screening information by lab technicians and decide if there's something wrong? I mean, this drives me nuts. They sent out this. This is, in fairness, is only a 73-page, 76-page document. And when you actually read this document, you find out that there's nothing in here about the March 14th data. There's nothing in here about the March 14th detection of tritium. This is about the August 17 detections and the August 17 readings. And I pointed this out to Lanell, who waits a week to get back to me and then says, oh no, those are the right, that's the right document. It's not the right document. I want the lab sheets from the technicians from the March 14th date. So this is the kind of round and round you get. And whenever you ask a direct question, if you point out that one and one is two and somebody disagrees with you, there's a problem. That's a problem other than the one you're talking about. If you ask a simple scientific question, you show up to a meeting and there are several officials there trying to convince you that and, and discredit you and convince you that you're wrong, there's something wrong. Something's going on. 
So here's the current condition on the Buckman diversion. This, this tritium detects.